Welcome to the Maniverse Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Traplin, and this is the podcast where we explore what it takes to build a successful, friendly local game store. If you like what you hear on today's episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on whatever fine platform you are listening on. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment letting us know your thoughts. As always, you can find the notes and links mentioned in today's episode at ManiverseSaga.com. This interview that you are about to hear with Scott Church is fascinating. Scott is the owner of Category 1 Games, an online-only store. He started way back in the mists of time, also known as 2004. A 20-year-old online-only store is interesting enough, but Category 1 Games specializes in dead TCGs, games that have been written off and dumped in the clearance sections of stores in the past are the bread and butter of Category 1 Games, and Scott has a thriving business because of them. And since game store owners often look at the products they sell as hot potatoes, Scott's experience may lead you to reevaluate that common wisdom. Maybe there is gold in those dead games sitting on your back shelves. We also talk a fair bit about Crystal Commerce and the struggle of working with a legacy system that has a huge amount of potential, as well as the intricacies of marketing online. And it's good stuff all around. Speaking of marketing, that is what we do. We help local game stores get more sales and establish a stronger presence online with digital marketing strategies like email, Google ads, meta ads, social media, content, and search engine optimization. And we'd love to work with you. If you go to maniversesaga.com forward slash MMA and book a free call, we'll go over your store's current digital footprint and put together a custom digital marketing strategy plan tailored to your business. We'll go over the plan together on the call and talk about how we can implement everything for you. And if you want to work together, that's great. If you want to take the plan and try implementing it in-house, that's cool too. Either way, it's yours to keep. We've helped multiple game stores in nearly every stage of the business, from pre-launch all the way to multiple millions in yearly revenue. And we'd love to help your LGS take advantage of the massive opportunities that exist online. Head to maniversesaga.com forward slash MMA to get started. Now let's jump into the interview with Scott Church. Right. Well, Welcome to the podcast, Scott. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Tom. I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's it's really a pleasure uh, to be on. Uh, you know, I've listened to many of your episodes, and uh, it's fun to actually be able to be on here and talk to you about uh, the hobby trade and kind of things that we love to talk about. So, yeah, no, I'm always happy to chat with somebody who's got the enthusiasm and the experience, and you know, is, is happy to be here. It's always fun having somebody who's uh, who shares that passion. So. Let's start off with talking a little bit about you. You know, let's uh, give the listener a, a little bit of background information about who you are. Uh, how did you get into this crazy business? Sure. So, I've been basically buying and selling hobby items most of my life, uh, mainly from things I enjoy to be able to pay for my hobbies. Uh, I really loved comic books as uh, in my early teens, and got in on the early image books, and you know basically the start of image comics uh, where a lot of the artists left Marvel and started their own company. Um, I love that whole scene of comic books at at that time period. Uh, I I still collect comics myself. I try not to sell them so I can keep them as a separate thing. I enjoy that. I'm not having to deal with the back and forth of buying and selling. I've been playing card games for a long time. My, my parents thought that magic was evil and so they didn't want me playing magic cards. I'm sure you've heard this before. And this was a big debate in the early 90s. You saw Inquest Magazine had articles on this. I think Scry did as well. A lot of people thought magic was evil. And so I got into Star Wars cards because I love Star Wars. But I also found they made a good buffer in a card box to hide underneath my bed where, you know, on both sides would be Star Wars. And then in the middle would be my magic decks. And so I, I, I basically was hiding magic cards underneath my bed while other kids are hiding other things. I was hiding magic. And so uh, I, I remember being at a magic tournament. This was for a box of fifth edition. I was in first place in this tournament. And out of nowhere, my parents walk into the game store and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm playing cards like I told you I was. And they're like, yeah, but this isn't Star Wars. And this shop was 30 minutes away from my house. Why'd they show up, find that I'm playing Magic? I, I took third instead of first. I, it just ruined my whole game. I got home. I got in trouble <laughs> for it. I mean, so stupid, really, when you when you go back and look at it. I've, I've got three teenage kids of my own, and I'm like, this is the stupidest thing to fight over, ground a kid over. So uh, I continued to play Star Wars. I, I was a junior in high school, and we, I was accumulating a lot of cards, and one of my buddies that – 
that was in this computer programming class with me said, hey, I've been trading with people online, but they have no way of really enforcing that I send the card. So I've been like saying I was sending stuff and then I'd never send it. And I was like, first mm -hmm. of all, you're a scumbag. But then second of all, like, I want to be able to buy and sell with people online. How do you do that? And this was uh, around April of 98. And so I found eBay and I created an eBay account and I started selling on that. And at that time, you know, you didn't, you couldn't upload pictures easily. You had to take an actual photo, have it develop, try to scan it and upload <laughs> it to a server and then upload the image. So, I mean, really the process to list an item if, with an image was really hard. You then had to wait for a check or money order. I mean, it was a, basically a month long process to be able to buy and sell things on eBay at that time. So I started selling on eBay and I graduated high school and I went away to college and I thought to myself, I want to be able to enjoy college and not worry about dealing in cards. So I kind of got out of card games and uh, I, I got married. And in 2003, I, my wife took an internship uh, at nights where she was gone. Uh, so I was like, I'm kind of bored. I'll just go down to the local store. And I started playing Lord of the Rings, Hero Clicks, uh, WWE Raw Deal. Verse System came out a little bit later. But I started getting back into card games and the hobby games. And my parents had gotten divorced. So I took all my cards and items that I had from home. And I moved them into my new uh, condo with my wife. And I started selling cards on eBay and, and was like, this is great. But I want a more consistent thing. I Michael Barr, who you've had on before, I've known him for a really long time. And he was a great mentor for me. He said, you should start a website instead of just selling on eBay. And so I, I did. And Star Wars CCG ended print in 2001. So this was 2003. So the game was out of print. Boxes were very cheap at that time, 10 to $15 a box. And so I was buying a lot of boxes. I had crack packs. You'd still be able to sell cards for like a dollar a piece. So I was, I was selling a lot on eBay and then on my website and we were the biggest seller of Star Wars CCG for a long time. And that was kind of my main game playing growing up. And so I I continue to be a big seller of that. And, and still to this day, that's basically our largest selling game. So my website started out selling Star Wars CCG. We then expanded into other card games, mainly out of print card games, because that's where my interest was. And mm. so we've now expanded to over, I think, 160 card games on the site, most of them out of print. And so that's, that's that's our specialty cool. is our what's considered dead card games, but uh, generally have collectors and players still love them that still love it. And there's usually a players committee for each of these games that keep these games alive and make virtual cards or other ways to continue to play it. I was very interested in that because I know I was looking at your website and I was kind of poking around a little bit and like, oh, this is a very different way of approaching things. It's <laughs> interesting. Right. Yeah, I mean, I just I went I just went on vacation, and there's a store I know of that had a back room uh, where I went on vacation, full of out of print card games, and so I I loaded up four boxes worth of all this dead stock to them that's been sitting on their shelves for ten to twenty years, and I I bought them out of these like four boxes worth of cards, and to me that's like you know something I can really use and my customer base loves that would never be found at this store. So we work with a lot of stores in clearing out their back rooms of these dead, this dead product to them. It's not going to sell in their store. They don't have expertise in it. We do. And so we can take that and get it into the hands of the collectors and players, whereas those stores that have that dead inventory, it's going to just continue to be dead for them. So we can, we can really help out stores and what we're doing and moving their outdated product. But to us, that's exactly what our customers are coming for. Yeah, that's really interesting. One of the one of the common nuggets of wisdom is that the hobby industry is very front listed. It's all about the new hotness, right? It's all about the new sets, the new books, all of that stuff, right? Most game stores, that's what they focus on. That's where the money's made, is buying and selling and getting getting the stuff out the door within that first weekend, first week, you know, first month, that sort of stuff. So it's really all about the the new stuff. Whereas your approach is really all about the stuff that is essentially, like like you said, dead inventory. For most stores, these are products that they cannot sell. So I guess my question is like, how did you, how did you find a customer base that you know is interested in this sort of stuff and that you obviously have been successful with and built a business off? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think that you know the website will turn twenty in November. Um, mm. You know, 
you had on before uh, Robin uh, Lowey, I think that's how you say her last name, from uh, Mind Taker Miniatures. And yep. I loved hearing her story because it felt a, a very similar to mine where she was she sells um, older Warhammer and miniature figures and basically collects those from people that have those sitting in their on their shelves and then has, you know, she turns around and sells them to collectors of those older miniatures. And that's a lot of what we do with these out-of-print games. And so that, that was really fun to hear her story, and it felt very similar to uh, kind of what we do. So how do we find a customer base? Uh, I'll give you an example. We recently added the game Magi Nation, which uh, came out around 2000 to 2003. It has five or six sets, and it had a big fan base. A lot of people really loved that game, and it was a Pokemon alternative kind of in the Pokemon came out of the U.S. in 99, so this came out in 2000, and it's it's kind of a similar style as Pokemon, kind of cutesy, whimsical type of card game. A uh, huge fan base for it, but no one supports it with selling it online. There's no singles available. There hasn't been an updated website since 2003 that has had all the sets listed. So I had all this inventory from various collections I bought from people. We sorted it out. We got the set list, we upload it, and we have to try to figure out pricing on it. And this one's tough. There's not a lot of eBay, eBay sales for it. So I started to pro I, I post in, uh, there's a collectors group on Facebook called the Dead CCG Collectors. And so I posted in there and said, who are my imagination fans? Can you contact me? And so I reach out to them. I say, what's the what's the going price on rares, on foils, this sort of thing? What what are you looking at? What's hard to get for this game? So they kind of get fill me in on some info. And so we guesstimate pricing based on that. In fact, there's an old scry book that was put out in 2003 that has basically every card game and info for it up to 2003. So I basically looked at that and said, what were the pricing in the better cards when this went to print? Even though that's 20 years old, at least it gives me a baseline for what was considered good at that time. And I'm sure it's still considered good now. So we, we upload the game, we have guesstimate on pricing, and we basically post to a few Facebook groups saying, hey, we have this available now. If you're interested in this game, come check it out. If you, if you feel like pricing is really off, let me know. Be glad to adjust accordingly. And we sold, and we had three of the four row boxes full of this game, and we're down to less than one and a half of those. It sold so well for us just in the first few weeks that we've had it up. We actually launched it on our site about the same time that we put up. Uh, it, we did it the week before Star Wars Unlimited came out. And mm. it we've sold more of Imagination than we have Star Wars Unlimited. And so that, <laughs> that tells you how popular that's been for us. And yet Star Wars Unlimited is a brand new game. And a lot of our customer base is from the old Decipher Star Wars CCG. And so we have a lot of Star Wars fans that only buy that game, but they said, hey, Star Wars Unlimited, cool, we'll start buying this too. So we, we do sell a few new games that relate to our customer base, but that imagination was like really an interesting case study of this game's really popular. In fact, there's a Kickstarter, I think, that just ended or is going on to bring it back, and there's people that love it, and a lot of these dead games are kind of in that same situation where people still love it, play it, collect it, they're excited to play with their friends that they can easily acquire. And that's what we try to do is make these items acquirable again and have one resource where they can go and be able to pick them up instead of having to hunt here and there on eBay or, you know, look at old websites from the early 2000s that are still like web 1.0 based. And we try to make it a lot easier for them. You're busting some myths right now. <laughs> on the fact that most of these things are just like, well, they're dead and gone. And they might as well just throw them out. Like I'm sure there are a lot of store owners who have, spent considerable money on inventory that for whatever reason the game you know went out of print to stop being supported what have you and just that was the end of it right you're essentially proving that some of these dead games these dead inventory pieces these things that stores have written off or sometimes have thrown in the garbage to get rid of that they're still very valuable people are out there that want them and to me this just sounds like more of a finding the audience for the, the products that you have is is as important or more important than the support of the actual publisher that created it. Right. You know, one of the things that with out-of-print card games, most stores will carry a game when it first comes out and then drop it once it becomes not as profitable for them. 
But for a lot of these out of print card games, those last sets are where the actual money's at and the earlier sets hold little value. So for example, Verse System, which was really popular in the early 2000s made by Upper Deck, most stores carried the first eight or so sets. And so those are the easiest ones to get today. But the last five sets were the ones that most stores didn't carry. And that's where all the value is at for the game. So we'll have people approach us and say, hey, I've got a collection of this. And I'll say, do you have the earlier sets or the later sets? And most people have the earlier because that's when most people played and collected it. But that's actually not where the value is at. And so, you know, their collection isn't worth as much. It's Most out-of-print games are basically opposite of Magic, where everything early in Magic is where the money's at. And that's what most people think. Well, I've got this earlier stuff. It must be worth a lot, like early Pokemon, early Magic. It's like, no, it's it's actually the later sets when the retailer is printing much less, not as many people are buying it, and now people coming back to it want to get into it. And it's usually overpowered because there's less play testing. They're just throwing stuff out to try to get it to sell. And so it's overpowered, it's underprinted, and it's very collectible at this point. And so that's generally where the money's at for these out-of-print games is those last few sets. Interesting. It's an inverse curve. That's pretty cool. How do you, I guess, how do you choose which games to support? Do you just, you know, whatever you can get a hold of? Like, how do you know which one's going to be the ones that have that audience that you can actually get a, a customer base from? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good question. Generally, games that have a property or a licensed property where people are interested out of it, you know, for outside of the game itself. So for the Cypher was a company that made the Star games in the 90s and 2000s. So those properties each have a lot of collectors outside of just those wanting to play the game. So Decipher, they thought that 20 to 30 percent of their sales were actually to people that played it, while 70 to 80 percent were to people that were just collectors of those properties. So if you think about that today, I sell a lot of Star Wars CCG, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, and not all those people are players that a lot of them are collectors while they still have player groups like the star wars players committee star trek continuing committee and so on to keep the game alive add in virtual cards run events that sort of thing each year for these games a lot of them are people that collect and another whole area that's come in the last few years are autograph seekers where they want to get these cards and get them autographed at conventions by the actors that play these characters. So we sell a lot of nicer condition cards to people that want that. And then these games are also seeing a large increase in the slabbing market for getting the card slabbed, like, you know, graded and, and want to be able to display a 9.8 or a 10.0 on their shelf for a game that used to love and play versus, you know, a lower condition version. So those higher collector base areas also come into it the last few years as well. So for games like that, it's easier to sell, whereas a game like Legends of the Five Rings, Doomtown, where these were RPG back games and they had great storylines and they had great player and collector bases, they don't expand outside of just their own license. And so there's not a big collector base looking for autographs or to finish it like a Lord of the Rings game has. So you have to realize what kind of property and background you have with selling it. Uh, so Verse System or Overpower, both of those are out of print games, but they, they tune into the comic collector fan group. And so we have a lot of people that just collect comic cards that say, Hey, I want all the Iceman. I want all of the Jean Grey. I want all the Wolverine cards. And so they'll come buy us out of, you know, one of each, or they'll buy all that we have of them just to have that collect that character. And so those are, you know, things that we look at. I, I talked about adding imagination. I, you know, I don't know a lot about that game. I didn't play it. I didn't know what pricing would be like. So if we have a game where we can easier, it's easier for us to find pricing, images, and so on, we're more likely to add it to our site and sell it than a game where we have to figure out pricing on our own. We have to rescan all the images on our own and do a lot more of the legwork uh, going into it. Uh, there's a game, Decipher made a game called Jedi Knights, which is a Star Wars-based game. And they they did the stupidest thing where there's a left and right facing version of the game of a card. There's a first day version of the card. There's a decipher silver stamp and a decipher gold stamp version of the card. So there's so many variants of just these single cards 
that it makes it really hard for a, a retailer like myself to add it to our site, sell it, list it, figure out pricing for each variation. And then we're supposed to carry stock for each version for the random person that might be like, hey, I need a white version with a silver stamp. And it's like, my goodness, that card's a dollar fifty, <laughs> and we spent, you know, thirty dollars on research just to add this one card on. And so that's where, you know, if a game makes it easier for us to sell it, we're much more likely to do it than putting in so much work in order to do so. For sure. There's a lot of uh, players or a lot of retailers that are having that trouble with magic right now or the last couple of years because just this proliferation of variants is making it, you know, what is normally a few hundred SKUs, right? If you're selling singles, could be thousands and thousands on every set release and it's getting a little out of hand, but it's making it a little bit uh, more complicated. But uh, yeah, I haven't heard of, uh, I've heard of quite that many little twists on the, uh, on the variants. That yeah, sounds like a real different... struggle. <laughs> It's, it's a real struggle. And, you know, Magic's doing this right now. And, and when you're a retailer and you are hiring employees that don't have the expertise in that, you know, I, I generally have high school, college age student uh, employees. You know, how are they supposed to know all these unique rules to a random game that came out in the early 90s? You know, or like how to tell a, a, a fourth edition foil or a regular foil from the set versus a reprint foil where the only difference is there's an X in the top right corner. You know, all these little intricacies that were put into these various games and Magic's overdoing it. And you talk to most retailers right now, just trying to keep that straight and train their employees on it, you know, is, is a nightmare. And I don't think these game companies realize what they're doing to the secondary market of, uh, you know, for the staff of people that have to work on that. <laughs> I don't think they take it into consideration and really, to some degree, they almost should because they're they're like killing their their sales force basically by doing that. Yeah, well, and I'm sure you know they they're, the number, revenue numbers are talking for them. That's what really focuses their attention. But I think you're right. I think there is a uh, there is a point where the variants just become a net loss, a net negative. Right? There's too many things that nobody cares about. Like I, I think uh, I think it was a, one of the Eldrain sets relatively recently it was actually there were so many special versions of the card that the regular version of the card was the most valuable version of the card or certain certain types of cards anyways which is a kind of a backwards kind of way like if it's supposed to be foil it's supposed to be a special treatment like theoretically it should be more scarce or like at least more interesting but it's actually like there's a bit of a player base revolt when it comes to that sort of stuff right well, it's interesting too, like, you know, Star Wars Unlimited has come out and I would have thought the foil version of the cards would be the most sought after, but the hyperspace is definitely what everybody wants, where it's basically a full bleed version of the card and it, it looks good, but the foils curl just like magic foils curl. And it, it, you know, there's already issues with at events where people have decks where that's, it's curling versus non-curling because they have foils versus not. Yeah. And it's like, you know, for these companies to release these cards, they really need to be better about what they're putting out. I, I look at early Magic, and early Magic sets, those foils never curled. In fact, those foils are beautiful. These early sets, you know, didn't curl for Magic. And, and how do we go back to that? How do we get back to non-foil issues with cards? Because that's really what people want. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's, like, interesting, like, the hyperspace looked great for Star Wars Unlimited, and the next set should be really good, and I just hope they get something with the foils under check where they can release them and they actually look nice and stay flat. <laughs> so That would be nice. Card quality at this point is paramount. I think it's something that players have been clamoring for for probably five to ten years, where they're like, oh, what is going on? Why was this working before? Right. Why isn't this working now? What What are we doing, right? Like this is a, uh, was it, uh, I think they crossed, or at least Hasbro crossed over a billion dollars in yeah. in revenue. Like you think you could spend some of that money on on some of the printing standards, but uh, right. who knows? <laughs> Maybe that's something they're working on. You know, yeah. Give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. Yeah. I had some questions about uh, getting the inventory in the first place, right? So you know, for most stores, they're just buy from distributors. They're getting the new stuff, right? So it's e easy enough, right? The the channel is not particularly complex. Uh, getting a hold of dead inventory, though, of, of products that have been out of print for 20 years, how do you go about doing that on a consistent basis to the point where you can run, like, a, a business that turns things over? Right. I mean, I mean, we rely so much on our customer base basically to refuel 
what we're doing, uh, as well as, like I said, uh, other stores that are looking to move back inventory. So we have a buy list on our website set up. So when our inventory runs low, it automatically goes onto our buy list. And so we're always buying. So right now I've got about 40 open buy lists. I've got six next to my desk right now that are here. And we have about an 80% send in rate of buy lists that people submit to actually getting it to us. So we get a lot of inventory coming back in through that way. We also buy collections, uh, WWE raw deal, the wrestling card game is huge for us. We do a lot with it. Uh, we have a, a global audience that's from Singapore to South America. Uh, it, we ship a lot internationally. It's awesome. And that fan base loves the game, and we get a lot of buy lists for that game. I have a former world champion that sent me his collection and said, hey, I'm ready to just cash out of this. Why don't you go through it? And so I'm going through basically a, a page in this binder at a time, uh, adding the cards to inventory, keeping an Excel file, what I owe him, and I pay him out basically $1,000 at a time as I'm going through that. And so we, we buy collections that way. We buy um, – you know, I'm, I'm always looking at stores that they're looking to move stuff. We'll pick that up from them. People contact us because we they know where the place to go to. So Star Wars CCG, we buy so many collections for that because people say, hey, I've got this old collection. What can I get for it? And so, you know, if you don't want to do the groundwork or legwork of inventorying everything yourself, trying to sell it to a buyer, you can you can sell it to us we we say that you probably make about 15 percent more if you do all the leg work yourself than if you were to sell it to us and so we we buy a lot of collections we then put the inventory on the site as well as the buy list on our site where we're always getting new stuff in and and putting fresh inventory up now we do get in a lot of games that we don't have on our site right now uh the game warlord i, I I have about the first five sets up on our site, but we have so much more for that game. I personally just don't know a lot about it to separate it out very easily and get those cards added. And I want to, I just haven't put forth the time for it. Same thing with hero clicks. We have so many hero clicks from the older sets that are just sitting in boxes right now that I eventually want to add, but there's just gains in front of it that are big sellers for us that we spend a lot of our time with that getting to these other games are on our list to do, but they just aren't the top priority. Um, Dragon Ball Z, uh, the early 2000s score game. This is something we've been working on uh, for a little while. We, we had two massive collections, totes full of this game that we had to sort out, separate by set, um, and then scan most of the images uh, because score didn't provide that for anyone <laughs> like some of the other better card game companies <laughs> did. And so we're having to do a lot of the legwork and price it all out. And we're getting that added to the site right now. So I, I have different employees that are working on different things. I have one employee that that's all she's working on for like the past two or three weeks where she's just like scanning images, sorting it all and so on. And once we get that finally up on the site, we'll really promote it. But that's kind of how we do things. And, and we sometimes I jump the ball and we, we add stuff and I don't have everything done for the game. And then other times we fully get it up and going and then we promote it. So that's kind of the two ways we do it when we don't have games on yet, but we will eventually. What kind of dollar amounts are we talking about when it comes to some of these old games? Yeah, I mean, we there's two different games for us that reach six figures every year in sales, which is, I mean, shocking that year over year out of print card games are reaching that fi that figure. But those are also the games that we pay the most for when we're buying them. So we, we kind of prioritize what's our top selling games. We'll put that at the higher tier of our buy list. And then, you know, middle tier selling games, we'll have middle tier and then games that just don't sell too much all throughout the year, we'll, we'll drop down lower. Um, there's games like uh, Netrunner, uh, which was a popular Wizard of the Coast release game. There's only three sets for it. You know, that, that game will probably sit for a little while, and then we'll have somebody that finds our site and said, hey, I love this game. I want to fully get back into it. They'll spend two to $5,000 buying all the stuff they're missing, the higher-end stuff, and fully get back into the game. And so it's cool to see something like that. Someone did that last November where this person, first-time customer, they bought $2,000 worth of stuff. Then, like, a week later, they spent another 1000 and you know, they're just stacking up on it. And so it's really cool to see stuff like that. And then you have other games that are more so dead, like 
Doomtown, for example, they relaunched that game as a living card game. And then I want to say it relaunched again as a living card game. And there's a bunch of sets for it, but there's just not a lot of value overall for it. There's not a lot of collectors for it. So it's just people that like to play here and there, maybe finish up a few decks. So, you know, it, it sells a few thousand or so each year, but not too much probably to cover the space that it takes up and, you know, the real estate it, it owns in our uh, behind me, like in, in the storage that we have. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so different games kind of have different various amounts. I mean, we, we probably do as much in sales as a retail store would, you know, a decent size retail uh, game shop would. That's probably about what we do in sales. And so for just being online only, we do really well for selling out of print games and, and really keeping these communities fed and, and going. You know, that's that's a big part of it, too, is I'm heavily involved with probably like 60 Facebook groups of various games where I I try to make connections, know the people, see what people are looking for and want in these various games and try to keep up with it. And it's, you know, that's a little bit tough when you're when you have so many different areas you're branching into and trying to like have a pulse on what's happening in each of them. And some of them are very slow. Uh, You know, there's, there's games like star Wars CCG where they're putting out a new set, you know, every few months from the players committee and that changes the prices as the meta changes and decks become popular, less popular and so on. And so some of these games, you just have to keep up with new releases for what they're, what they're doing uh, with their virtual cards and, and things along those lines. Yeah. I was gonna gonna mention that because that's that's one thing that I've at least had some experience with, because uh, you know, I can't remember what, exactly what year it was, but it was a long time ago. Back when uh, you mentioned Score Dragon Ball Z, Panini released its own version of Dragon mm-hmm. Ball Z, ten ish, twelve ish, somewhere some somewhere in that uh, time range uh, years ago, and then I think it it ran for a few years and they let it die out, and uh, it had the same sort of situation where a group of people kind of took over as the stewards of this game there's enough people online and, and part of the community that they still wanted to keep it somewhat going and they continue to like essentially develop new sets which is kind of kind of interesting right it, it really explores this idea of like well what makes this legitimate right it's just we're all kind of agreeing to it as players of this game to respect this thing as the authority right the uh this is the definitive version of the game whereas uh something like magic right if you know if somebody comes out with their own custom magic set that doesn't it's nothing right it's if it's not printed by wizards it doesn't count it doesn't exist it's not canon right but it's uh with games that have been abandoned by their publisher there's room for for that kind of community to spring up which is really cool but also uh kind of strange in a lot of ways so it sounds like the you know, the, the cards that you're talking about, the, the games that have those four, five, six, seven sets and then got, you know, left to the wayside, they're continuing on. And then those sets that were initially printed, they still hold a lot of value to these people. There's still customers. There's still people willing to spend considerable amounts of money on picking up some of these older cards that maybe nobody else really thinks is worth anything. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's really fascinating. So, you know, more recent examples of games that have that had a, a fairly popular fan base and then then died basically are uh, Transformers TCG and uh, Star Wars Destiny. So if you take Transformers, the card game, I mean, this was a really popular game. Wizards of the Coast was putting it out. You know, there's a lot of Transformers fans out there that don't play it, but just collected the cards. And they put out the fifth set just right as COVID was hitting. And so it basically shut down the game and it had a big online presence. There's a lot of people that went to events. There's a lot of people posting deck lists. And it was really exciting to see as the meta was changing with each release and what people are coming up with. And then that fifth set came out and people were excited about it. And then Wizard of the Coast basically said, all right, we're, we're canceling the game because we don't know when we're going to be able to do events again and we're just going to cancel it. So right away, there became three to four different splinter groups all wanting to create their own fan-made sets and create their own stuff for it. And so it made kind of a splinter in the communities. And a lot of people were getting, you know, cards made uh, kind of secondhand for these different sets that were being released. And I, I think finally a lot of them came together and have formed one group now that is making official sets where they hold events and they're actually doing, using these cards from the official sets instead of having so many splinter groups. And so it's interesting to see 
some of the older card games, there's usually just generally one group running it, but then a more recent game where so many people could just easily make their own stuff and put it out there and say, hey, this is the new set that we're coming out with. And it's like, but but who's going to recognize that from the community? And once you kind of have one group that's managing it, it's really cool to see what they can come up with. Whereas Star Wars Destiny, you know, those cards had dice associated with it. So people aren't going to be making dice or stickers to put over existing dice. So it creates a whole new complexity that really is hard to follow up on with a group looking to continue on with the game. Uh, you can make cards, but you can't make, the, it's harder to make the dice aspect of it. Anyway, so it's, sure. it's really cool to see like with these more recent games that have gone out of print, how they're handled. Now you mentioned Dragon Ball Z and there's been so many iterations of each of the games. And, and I think they just restarted it again with a more basic version. And it's like, I feel bad for everyone that plays these Dragon Ball Z games and, and loves it and cares about it because you're going to be rebooted every two to three years. It decreases the value <laughs> of what you had. And you're having to buy into whole, something wholly new, you know, every two to three years. What a pain. <laughs> so. uh, I think uh, I think as a Dragon Ball Z fan, I, you know, we're just in it for the ride. We don't care that much. It's like <laughs> yeah. we're, we're going to enjoy it while it's there. We'll just move on to the next thing. Like if, if you looked at the number of Dragon Ball video games that were created, I oh, think yeah. there's at least 100. Oh, like it's just it, that's just the way it goes. They just get pumped out and you enjoy it for a little while. And then the next one comes out and it's, <laughs> you know, you move on to it. You just keep moving on. Yeah, that's just the culture I think around the fandom in particular. But, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's really cool though. I think that's one of the really interesting things that the game lives on. I like the dynamics of like the community kind of figuring it out and sorting it out amongst themselves, and you know, it's, it's like a, a very interesting little microcosm of society, right? Just oh yeah. There's there's different groups and and different personalities and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just a really cool cool situation. I mean, I mean, I take to... a game, take a game like Legends of the Five Rings. It really made tribes within its own game, where a lot of people found: Are you a Scorpion Clan person? Are you a Phoenix? Are you a Dragon? You know, there's different. <laughs> each one had kind of a background, and like, if your personality is like this, you might fit in better with Unicorn than you would with Dragons. And so, people would really get into it personality wise. And so it's it's really interesting, even with like the games, like, hey, I love Star Wars, so I'll just play the Star Wars game. But then, like, what kind of style of play do you use? Are you aggro? Are you control? Like, I, I love that with the various games where you can have various fandoms and then personality types that relate to deck styles within each of those games. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like Hogwarts houses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Ravenclaw. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. That's uh... a yeah, it's, it's cool. I, I like that. I think it's a really interesting aspect of, of the hobby and the fact that games continue to live on. And, like, you can find your group of people. You know, like, if you really love a game, there's a good chance that you can find somebody who also really loves that game. Oh, I yeah. think that's a really hopeful message, too, right? Like, as players, that there's – the game lives on, right? You know, even games that have been dead for 20 years, there's there's still a demand for them, and there's still enough people out there who would happily probably play a game with you if you uh, if you could find one. Well, and there's so many ways to now play online, you know, whether it's webcam where you're playing face to face with someone, which has really opened up a lot of these games where people are playing with family members that live on the other side of the of the world or continent, whatever it may be, uh, mm. to like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings both use a program called GIMP, G-E-M-P. And if you do GIMP, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, you, you can find that. Same thing with uh, Middle Earth has Cardinum. A lot of people use uh, Lackey to be able to play a lot of these out-of-print games. So it's really cool to, that people are still able to find each other and play online, even if they're not able to find physical people to play with, uh, you know, for events. But that's that's the joy of a lot of these games is traveling to places and seeing friends and and having that community of players. So, like, the Middle Earth card game is has generally been much bigger over in Europe, but they just held a big event in Sacramento, and I want to say they're holding one in Las Vegas. So they're trying to build up a American side of player base and interest for it. The Star Wars group, they usually try to plan events around like baseball games or different things where they can go to together and then go play in the Star Wars event. So it becomes much more of a community of people that enjoy these hobbies, flying, getting together, you know, going out for meals and, and drinks and spending time doing their hobby, but other interests with these people that they also enjoy. 
So it's really cool to see these groups really expanding beyond we're just card players to actually we're friends hanging out. And this is one aspect of what we're doing. At first, it made me think this is one of the things that I really love about the games. This is it's one of the things that you know drew me to Magic and Pokemon and, and board games in general is that the get together, the friends, the connections, the humanity that you meet and you know the friends you make along the way kind of stuff like that's an intrinsic element of it that i think what is what makes games so good in a lot of different ways but then also it's kind of interesting to think that uh I, i'm pretty sure uh you and i are roughly the average gamer at this point we're all kind of grown up right, right. whereas in our 20s you know you're in college you're kind of doing your school thing you're, you're still really involved but I couldn't really imagine a lot of 20 year old you know, students like hopping on a plane to go to Vegas to go play with their friends, right? They'll, they'll probably meet at the game store, but that's, that's right. kind of evolved. That's changing because our lives, like the people who played those games back 20 years ago are now us and our life situations are different. So the average gamer, the average board game card player has very different requirements and needs and, and interests and desires. And, also like just you know abilities to fly right which is not always the case when you're when you're young but uh it's interesting to think that like that's the evolution of the trading card game player metagame that's going on oh yeah for sure i mean if you look at you know you had michael barr on uh the store i grew up playing at was uh called outer limits in franklin tennessee it's a suburb of nashville and that store is owned by one of the guys i grew up playing with uh ray and uh Anthony both own that store and it, it's crazy because I was offered to buy that when I was coming out of college and my wife was like I'm not moving to Tennessee so you can run a game store you know you you went to college for a different reason and I always did this job as a side business up until a few years ago when I switched to doing it full time but I you know having a retail store is always something I looked at but I never wanted to be married to it whereas doing online I I can travel, I can do different things, and I'm not worried about a storefront. But, you know, it's interesting. Most people that own stores now grew up playing these games or, you know, or the hobby industry in the 90s are, are generally in their 40s, you know, early 50s, and they enjoyed this in the 90s, and now they're game store owners. I, I when, when we were growing up and the owners of those stores generally were not, they were basically comic book fans or sports card fans that added the game space because that's actually what kept them in business. So it's interesting to see like who's running it now versus who was running it when we were growing up. Yeah, so much has changed. It's very interesting. Kind of zooming out a little bit and looking at it in a multi-decade perspective. But uh, yeah, I guess that's a little bit more just philosophical and, and talking about the culture and stuff. Not really getting into the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, which is I, one thing I did want to ask about. Promotion, marketing, all of that fun stuff. You know, the the things that I like to... I generally like to dive into in my personal day to day. How do you like outside of, you know, being involved in these Facebook groups? Cause that's something you said, you know, it already that uh, that's something you put a lot of time into is just being connected to the pulse of all of these things that are going on, just being part of these communities. What else do you do to get some of the stuff out in front of these people and actually sell some product? Sure. So my uh, undergrad is in marketing advertising. And so I, Cool. I love advertising. I love marketing. I, I think it's such an interesting aspect that I don't think a lot of game stores understand. And so, you know, from Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram, Twitter, X ads, you know, we, we try to put our advertising in front of people that would, that aren't our regular customers as well as our regular customers. So we try to hit up both. Um, TikTok, something that we've, experimented with a little bit here and there. YouTube videos have been very successful for us. Just, you know, doing a box opening of an older game or doing a collection break, or I I love the old Inquest and Scry magazine. So I did a series up till I think Inquest 10 of looking through each issue and going page by page. There's, there's a YouTube channel called Cartoonist Kayfabe where they were doing that with Wizard Magazine. And there's like a Wizard Guide to Podcast, which does like, they go through the Wizard Magazine uh, and I was like, why can't I do that for inquest? I did that for a little bit. I just ran out of time and to be able to do it. So like those type of things make a big impact. A lot of people will reach out and say, Hey, I saw your inquest magazine, such great memories. I'd love to pick up some cards <laughs> from this game that I played from the nineties, you know? And so a lot of it is 
a lot of what we sell is the nostalgia of it, the good feelings you had from playing these games, being part of them, whatever it may be. And then usually people want to share that with their kids, with, uh, you know, a friend that they enjoy playing with as a kid. So the kid, the, the guy that got me into magic cards, whenever I sell like fourth edition or third edition cards, I always take pictures of them and send them to them. Like, Hey, check out what got ordered today. Uh Oh, it says I stopped the recording. Does it show that on your end? No, it says you're still going on my end. Okay. Good deal. So yeah. So I think now it stopped and it's back. Okay. Hopefully it stays back here. So yeah, so we just try to be in front of people as much as possible. We do. Uh, we try to do daily posts of new items that we got in or highlight a game that might not be as popular, or even popular ones. So that's something that we try to do and, and post those to all of our socials and just try to be involved with these various communities. I also try to make myself very easy to reach out to, uh, either through our business channels or directly on Facebook. You know, I, I think most people know me even more so than my business. And so a lot of people reach out just directly to me. Um, and so I'm, I try to be as approachable as possible and, and be involved as much as possible for that. But yeah, I do Google ads, Google analytics, you know, all the back end Google stuff we do, we, we track our own website conversions, you know, where, where are people at in the funnel? Uh, you know, basically everything you, you learn about in marketing classes today, that's, that's what we do. I've worked with a marketing agency here the past year, where we broke down a lot of things that we're doing. Uh, we use the Crystal Commerce platform, uh, which unfortunately is not as robust to SEO and marketing as I would like it to be. For people that use like Binder or are on um, like Shopify, there's a lot more marketing tools and SEO that's available there than what Crystal Commerce has. And we have the promise that we're gonna get that in Crystal Commerce. I hope we do because it would be awesome. Uh, but right now, we're there's a lot of SEO that we're flying blind on because of the limitations of Crystal Commerce's back end. So if, if they can update those to current standards, I, I mean, I think we'd be flying really high, and I, I'd be really excited about it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was going to ask because uh, yeah, I've I've worked with with clients on Crystal Commerce, and am at the moment, and they they run into those limitations pretty quickly. Yeah. The platform doesn't, doesn't have a lot of those modern day stuff or modern day features that right. connect with things like Google ads and stuff like that. And I was wondering how, how did you, uh, how, how did you navigate that? Do you have somebody who's <laughs> like working with you on the team? Yeah, like, how do you, uh, like, how do you track conversions? Like it's, that's one of those things that, whoops, big bit of a bump there. that's one of those things that I wish more stores could do easily. And like, I would, if people could figure out, okay, what's your conversion rate on your website? What's your, you know, what's your conversion rate in person? Like if you can figure out that sort of information, those are really helpful metrics to understand whether or not something's working, whether or not the messaging is working, whether your ads are working, like without that, you're flying blind. So how'd you figure that part out? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's such a tricky thing. So, you know, I, I use a lot of Google analytics and GA4 has been a much bigger problem than what the previous generation of Google Analytics was, which actually tracked your ad sales without needing a uh, conversion tracker. And now with GA4, they require a conversion tracker. And Crystal Commerce's setup is not set up to be able to handle that in its current state. So we used to be able to see what our sales were through Google Ads, what, our, what each one was basically bringing in for us sales-wise. And now we don't see that. And so a lot of that is we're halo affecting it, unfortunately, um, because we don't have a way to track it. And so I, I can increase what we're spending on ads and I can gauge it against revenue and kind of get an estimate that way. But I don't have a exact way of being able to tell what it is ever since the, the GA4 update to Google, which is really a shame because basically Crystal Commerce, from what I've been told, every crystal commerce user uses the same checkout and you have to create a Google tag for when someone checks out. And so it would give mm -hmm. me every, like everybody's checkout versus just my own unique checkout. And that's yeah. where the issue lies with crystal commerce right now. And so this is a big limitation of the site for people that want analytics. The problem is, is crystal commerce is so robust. Their base is so beautiful in what it does that trying to move to any other site, I'd lose so many other things that I need that I can't replicate it like a binder, right? Or any of these other companies that offer websites. 
Crystal Commerce offers so much robust items, but what they're lacking are things I still need, and I don't know how to get that at this point. And so if you're a web developer and you can create a system that does what Binder does mixed with Crystal Commerce, you're going to have every game store flocking to you because we need the robustness of Crystal Commerce, which Binder can't provide, but we need the updated tools to a modern website that Binder has that Crystal Commerce doesn't currently have. And Crystal Commerce has been working on new code base for what feels like the last three or four years plus, and we've been hearing about it. But until it actually switches to that, I mean, we're, we're flying on early 2000s back-end tech. And mm -hmm. while that does a lot of robust things, like it connects us to eBay, you know, Amazon, these other places, that I can do a buy list off of it. I can create my own products and so many good things about it that Binder can't do. But there's things that Binder can't do that Crystal Commerce can't touch. And that's that's where we need a combination right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I use all the Google Analytics to still track what I can. I have, I have a friend that owns a company called Blade Ops. Uh, they sell knives. If you want to check out a beautiful website, go look at that. It's built off of Shopify. They have a beautiful search feature functionality where you start typing and it'll bring up images of what the items could be that you want, as well as the categories for it until you have it up. So if you type in like a blood, butterfly knife, just type in butterfly, it'll bring in all of these like beautiful things in the search. And, you know, I've approached Crystal Commerce and said, we need that. That's what we need to be able to do. When people come to my site and they search, I want it to be like that. If you want to build us a modern website, that's what we need. And I said, we also need it for the SEO. Those guys SEO like crazy. They have a great functionality with YouTubers and they give, they can track the conversions from YouTubers and affiliates through affiliately. And I can't do that with Crystal Commerce because they don't accept the code for it. And if they could do that and I could say to the you know affiliates, hey, we'll pay you a percentage of everything you bring in. Here's 5%, here's 10% of everything you help us sell directly from you. We could send out so many more out of print boxes, you know, or things to cut, you know, people to open online. They can open it. Then they're getting a percentage of it plus the product they open. Anyways, there's so many like cool things available that, that really like the limitations of your website really impact and hurt you when they can't bring you everything you need. I, I hope yeah. that answers it, Tom. Like I, I love does, Crystal yeah. Commerce. I, I love Crystal Commerce and I need them to update themselves to where we need them to be because we're getting passed behind on the back end. Whereas like, you know, I've been selling Star Wars CCG since 2004. I should be the number one ranked thing when people look us up on Google and we're not for Star. If you type in Star Wars CCG singles, I don't think we come up as number one and we should be. And other more modern websites that have been built that are like competitors, let's say, they can get ranked higher because they have modern designs. You know, so which yeah, which is more which, of a factor, and like that is a whole, a whole other episode and a whole other conversation is like what yeah. it takes to make that happen. I've talked to Dan, and I've talked to the, some of the guys on the Crystal Commerce team, and I've seen the beta version of Crystal Commerce 2.0, and it looks like this thing's coming along, and they've actually got something pretty cool cooking. And once that does, you know, get fully unveiled and we're ready to go, I think it's got something really, they got something really cool. They've, they've, they've caught up and like they were a, a big leader, right? Like their core function of what the website does is really unique. It is good. It's the, one of the first ones to actually do what it did when they made it. It's just when they built it, it was appropriate for 10, 15 years ago and it just needs to be updated. But yeah, it's just a big undertaking. So that's uh, I'm I'm hopefully optimistic that Crystal Commerce is going to unveil something and bring themselves into the 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 21st century kind of thing <laughs> i i feel like it's an early web 2.0 based system and right now we're basically on the precipice of web 3.0 and you know we need them to be there you know it's almost like a playstation 2 versus a playstation 5 you know graphic wise <laughs> so yeah like we're what back lots of great games running? but yeah lots of great, great games what you need right now you got a ton of hits, but there's a modernization that we need, and, and that's where we need to be. Hopefully I can get uh, one of the guys on to the podcast at some point in the future and then kind of explore what's going on with uh, with the new system and kind of really dig into the details, and, and maybe we'll see some new, some new stuff hopefully this summer. But, right. Uh, and like, like I said, crossed I, on all that. I, I love those guys. I mean, I, I need them to be successful for me to be successful. 
right? So I'm not trying to dog on them for what their system is. I think it's great. I, I think it's so robust. It just needs updating. So yeah, if they can if they can get to that point, man, it's going to be humming, and I think you'll, they'll see a ton of business coming over to them because they would definitely be the top tier system in place. All right, I want to keep you too much longer. I feel like we could probably keep chatting about all kinds of stuff, <laughs> but I, I want to like make this a reasonably concise episode. So let's ep- end this with the final question, which I'm sure you know. What I like to explore is the idea of success. So what does success mean? To you and what does success look like for category one games yeah i mean success for me was turning this from like a business i was doing on the side to something i've been doing now full time for about four years and continuing to do it the nice thing about this business is i have my son has worked with me the last four years and that's really helped build up the business he's going away to college though this fall which is a real bummer uh to lose him uh, i i've lost some other staff that are going to college as well and so I'm, I'm shifting over with a bunch of new staff starting here in the fall. And so success is just continuing to build it and hopefully being able to continue to do this as a full-time thing and not have to switch to something else and move it back to a side business. I've, I've got two office spaces we rent and use as basically warehouse space that we work out of. It's, it's less than five minutes from my house. It's downtown in our community. We're a community business. We have people from the community that work for us. And so it's, it's fun to be in that space. Now, if we ever, I think it'd be fun to do a retail side of it, but at the same time, I love just being online. You know, if I want to come in at 10 o'clock, I can, if I want to stay till midnight, I can, I work my own hours. I'm not held to, you know, online or a retail space standard. And so this has been very successful for me and something I've really enjoyed doing. So right now we, we've been in success. Now, where does it go? I, I think we'll continue to add other games. And yeah, I think success is kind of where we've been the past few years of really being able to do this business, grow it, family, community. I think it's been really fun, um, as well as the community of gamers and people I get to meet online that have become really good friends. And so I think that's the joy of this of this business. I, I picked up a bunch of My Little Pony card game. The last few sets of that are really expensive and hard to find. And I got a lot of sealed product for it. And I contacted one of the guys that's a regular and said, Hey, I got these. I'm going to offer them to you before anyone else want to work out a deal. And so we did, and he was super happy about it. And that, you know, that was really good for us too. And so I think success is finding that joy in what you're doing and, and trying to enjoy this. Sometimes it can feel like a job. And my son watched me grading the other day and he's like, my, my youngest son, he's 12. He's like, that's really cool that you get the great card games and that's your job. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of like the worst part of it for me is spending the time grading. But at the same time, like, that's cool that a 12 year old can like tell you how sweet your job is, you know, so I'll take it. So I'm like, I, I got to recognize the good times with that as well, more than I probably do. So mm. I think that's a really good little bit of advice to kind of close out on, like realize, you know, where you're at and like the day to day grind might feel not the best when you're in it, but you know, you're, you're dealing with card games and, and making people happy. Like you're doing something that brings people joy. You know, you could be working in a coal mine. <laughs> like there's other, <laughs> way, right. way worse things that you could be spending your life making money on. So this is a, it's a pretty good place to be. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's great. And I mean, I get to work my own schedule, you know, and I make decent enough money to get by and, and survive and so, and get a little bit ahead. So, I mean, I'll take that and we'll also be able to share the joy of card games with other people. So yeah, Absolutely. can't ask for more. All right, where can uh, where can people go to find out more and yeah, connect cate- with you if they want to say hey? Yeah, Category1Games.com is our website. You can look up social media. Basically, for all of that is on every social media platform under Category1 Games, YouTube, you know, Instagram, TikTok, all of that. Uh, we have a newsletter you can subscribe to where you send out a news- weekly newsletter. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly on Facebook. I'm fairly easy to find. Uh, just Scott Church, and uh, I'm in the Dead CCG, Dead CCG group and other card game groups quite often. So reach out anytime, anybody. I'm sure they will. Well, thank you very much for uh, for joining me on the podcast, having the conversation. Tech issues were super fun, but it'll be, you know, it, it happens. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad we could, uh, we could chat tonight. Yeah, Tom, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. I really appreciate what you do and, and bringing spotlight to a lot of these game stores and, 
gaming community items that are really important and cool for, uh, you know, those of us that are in this world. So I really appreciate what you do as well. Thank you. It's always nice to feel, to hear, to hear some appreciation. I don't get that very often because I'm just usually talking into the void. So that feels good. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for today's episode. We will talk to everybody again in the next episode of the Manverse podcast. All right, that is it for today's episode of the Maniverse Podcast. Do not forget to hit the subscribe button and stay up to date whenever we upload. And if you like what you hear, we'd also appreciate a quick five-star review on iTunes. Thanks again for listening to today's show. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate Scott for coming on and sharing his time and his wisdom with us. I'm Tom Traplin. I've been your host, and I will talk to you again in the next episode of the Maniverse Podcast.